testified against me. And then I plea bargained to zero to six. The judge gave me four. With a, 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 a and Cordy told me to fucking come back in 120 days. And if I behaved myself, he reduced my sentence when they cut it to community corrections. And that's the hardest thing I went through. Prison ain't hard. It's that community corrections. That's how they hang you. Because you can't do make shit. Make one mistake. You, make, you can't be in a bar. Your, your life is six to six. You know, basically, you have to live under a strict life. And even then, like I said, I was... And if your friend's a felon, he better walk right by you. He better yeah, slap you five. Yeah, you can't talk to him. You can't Yeah, uh, you better not say, hey, man, let's see. You better just walk right by you. It's a hard life at that point. But you know what, man? I did it. I paid my debt to yeah. society. You know, I got divorced. I fucking lost everything. I started again. And the only thing that I could think of was comedy. And I just wanted to be a regular comedian. I wanted to hide. And I ended up in Los Angeles. And the next thing you know, I was like Richard Gere, an office and a gentleman. I had nowhere else to go. Yeah. Mitzi Shaw, God rest his soul, gave me spots, spots, spots. Then a dude, Joe Rogan, I put, he came into my life and he taught me how to be a professional, you know? And uh, here we are, 27 motherfucking years later, comedy saved my life. You Amazing. Ever you ever think about doing residencies in like Vegas or anything? I just did Treasure Island Friday yeah, awesome. and it was tremendous. I really liked them. I did the South Point before, they were very nice also, but it's time to you know move on up a little bit. I'm 56. I got one foot in the grave, one a banana peel. I got a lot of life left in me, <laughs> dog. I got a lot of life, life left in me. So I still do my little every two weeks on the road. I got the podcast. I, I, I got the kid. It's, I got to talk to you about something real quick. I taped my kid. You know, I'm Cuban, and Cubans are very proud of their boxes. So uh, I taped my kid hitting the mitts, uh -huh. and I sent it to my uncle. He's 80. And my uncle came back. He goes, you tell that fucking teacher of hers that we're distant cousins of Kid Chocolate, yeah. right? So I know that part of your fucking uh, genius is that you watched a lot of tape. There ain't nobody that could tell you a story about a fight. His name is Eligio Sardinas. Sardinia, Sardinia, yeah. compadre. Sardinia, you know what Sardinia means in no, Spanish? No, it's a Spanish uh, name, but that's from Spain, Yeah, right? that's yeah. What, no, Sardinia means, uh, uh, what are those things that you eat in prison? Sardines. Sardines. Fish. Sardines. Yeah. yeah. So Sardinia, yeah. Kid Chocolate, Sardinia. When you're in New York, and I was, and I lived in a, in Union City, is the second biggest Cuban population in the country. A big shout out to Lucio Fernandez. And uh, when before you got into a fight when you were Cuban, the first thing you told the motherfucker is, "Listen, before we box, I just want you to know." My cousin's kid chocolate. Really? Are you <laughs> no, no, but it's a fucking island. We're all yeah. cousins. I did the 23 nah, and I'm, me. I'm, I'm, I'm 40% African. What the but, fuck? But I'm just saying that the fact that he was that popular, he kid was, chocolate, really. He was they, that popular. Yeah, I remember. I watched a lot of films about him. That's why I knew his How name. How good was he? He was magnificent. Did he really fight 25 times in one year? I, listen, I wouldn't doubt it. Listen, he had 100 amateur fights in Cuba and he was undefeated with like 85 knockouts. Is that true? They said they redid it. The historian went in. And nah, he, um, he only had 50 Dick, knockouts. Let me tell you something about Kid Chocolate. It, drop it on me. I'm let fucking Let me tell you something <laughs> about Kid Chocolate. It's not some things are not something. Kid Chocolate was very promiscuous. You know, and um, he fought like he had a lot of disease, like venereal diseases and stuff. I believe that's how he, that probably he got sick and stuff. He got sick from venereal diseases and stuff. These are the legends that I wrote, that I read and stuff. And I saw, and I saw pictures of him. Um, I believe it was on um, what? What year was it? It was something happened at the. You, um, I, I watched it on Um and I think after I'm gonna look on YouTube and see they showed pictures of him in Cuba, like in the '80s, like in '80, 80, '84, '88, something to that effect. And he was, he was just old, broken down man, but he was a magnificent fighter. He was so inspirational for fighters like Archie Moore, Henry Armstrong, because when they saw him fight, he was. Um, he made more money than the heavyweights. He made like $100,000 a fight in one particular fight or something like that. And that's why he was so popular. Everybody just loved him. Everybody, he, they made songs. Um, Wilson was going to make songs about him. Um, Count Basie did songs about um, Kid Chocolate and stuff. He was just a magnificent um, sensation when he came to America. He moved to New York and he Yeah, he was awesome. He was from awesome. Panama, Al Brown and all those guys. He was just magnificent. It's just that he had got sick. 
Did you watch a lot of tape on him and study I him? I watched everything. I watched him fight Fidel La Barba. I watched him fight all those guys that um, he had to fight. He was a magnificent fighter, man. Kid, I mean, for Tony Cantoneri, for all these guys. He had, listen, he had uh, probably 150 fights, pro fights. Great fight, very sensational fighter, very popular fighter, one of the most popular fighters. And they had people name their, name themselves after him too. Right, you right. Know, such a kid chocolate, big kid chocolate, chocolate, this and that. Sardinia. Awesome fight. When people. he came to um when Castro took over, he was a very wealthy guy, kid chocolate, but he took everything. And he died in Cuba, correct? Yeah. Castro he, took everything? He was wealthy, yeah. He had money and Castro took all the property and all the cash out of the bank. You know, they turned they were communists, so I guess that would basically... They had to shut it down. Yeah. It's funny how many uh, venereal diseases, when Columbus went to Cuba, he brought back, like he took something, He brought then he went back, and what they brought back was sugar and syphilis. Yeah, mm. I would see the rumors were the cut. Yeah, Cuba was sick. a big syphilis fucking yeah. hotbed. Interesting. You know, I tested hot for syphilis a few times, no biggie. <laughs> I moved on. Fuck it. Doing all right? No, nah, I'm doing all right. I ain't yeah, never catch it. no fucking syphilis, you know? <laughs> Maybe they, I ain't never caught no shit like that. I caught like the that. crabs one time yeah, in 85. <laughs> but that was shit. it. Holy Fuck. shit, man. Well, the time you guys came up, I'm just glad you didn't get the, the HIV. Oh, man. man. Thank God. No, you know what? I, I can't see needles. <laughs> God, God threw me a big blessing. I can't see needles. So... Mm. I never, I think I snorted heroin maybe two times, three times, and I liked it. So I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you, but I knew that it would be a problem. I had enough problems on my hands with the addictions I already had, so I left it alone. And I don't, till this day, I've been clean 11 years from that white fucking devil. Amazing. And it, I don't know how I did it. I woke up one day and... Uh, that was it. There was no rehab. There was no hugs. I looked at my, my girlfriend at the time, and I knew I didn't want her to find me on the floor. There's some people, like you and me, we're born to find motherfuckers on oh, the no, floor. Oh, no. Um, last week, my friend on the floor. So OD. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh. So, in see, Brooklyn, OD. Sorry, on the Mike. Floor, on the floor. There's some people who aren't cut out for that. It'll change their whole life. My wife is from Tennessee, good family. I didn't want her to find me on the floor. And one day, I just stopped. And I keep the reefer because it keeps my mind back on the street and who the fuck I was. That's the last thing I do because it, it's my teddy bear, Mike. I started smoking chocolate tie in, in 1980 and, you know, gold. That was a good year, Oh, my God. bed style, chocolate tie up there. Sure, that's jeans, That shit baby. would fucking kill you. <laughs> and, sure, and that's So jeans. I always kept marijuana. I don't like the word sober. It makes people edgy. People that live sober, they have to hide or something. I don't like the word sober. Well, I got to tell you something Go ahead. that I just read Go in ahead. this uh, book, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. It's all about psychedelics and LSD and psilocybin. And he talks about in there how one of the, the main AA founder, Bill Wilson, mm -hmm. he had his, they talk about in the 12 steps, they talk about having a spiritual awakening. Bill had his spiritual awakening in a guided uh, trip on this stuff called Belladonna, which is like a hallucinogenic compound. And he was a huge believer in the idea that LSD could cure alcoholism. He was a big believer in psychedelics. It kind of blew, blew my mind. I knew that too. You know? Because what it does, these things are different. You know, they... they crush our ego they show us all our trauma and, and our pain and they help us forgive ourselves you know joey do you still do any uh i know you've posted like jars of fucking mushrooms on on your instagram you but MDT? do you still it's funny it's funny when i we were talking about mescaline we used to get mescaline hits that back in the day and back in the day and four-way and 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 stuff. Stuff. my mom died i started doing acid maybe a year before my mom passed but when my mom passed, the, the reason why I'm, one of the reasons I'm still here is because I went on an acid fucking tear for like a year. Mm. You know, I'm scared now that I might have something because for a year I did acid. I would go home at night, put do a hit of acid, and listen to Black Sabbath. I would force myself. And then my mother died in 79, and in 80, 
The Wall came out. They do a song called Mother. Oh, yeah. And Ozzy Osbourne has a song on his album, Mother, Please Forgive Us. Mm. And I would force those on myself and face my reality that my mother was gone. I mean, it took me wow, five man. years. Grief is a yeah. fucking motherfucker. Yeah. It took me basically from 79 to 84 to basically realize when she was gone. Even though they put her in a hole, I was there. There were nights I would still drive by my old house just to see if they made a mistake. And she got caught at Yonkers Raceway in traffic and just, you know. So uh, the acid helped me deal with it. I hated, I hate myself for doing it, what I did, but one of the reasons why I'm still here is because I faced my fucking uh, well, I think pain. It's, you know? Yeah, yeah, man. I think it's very therapeutic. You know, they're they're coming out with more and more studies about how these things are helping people deal with depression, dying, you know, the most intense things that happen in life, you know, and that's what kind of blew my mind is that the 12 steps that he put together are really the steps of a psychedelic trip. You know, you surrender to something, you realize that you are in the hands of God and you make an encounter with God and oneness and we are all connected. And then you experience some sort of inventory of seeing all the things that you did wrong, you know, all of the trauma that you caused in your life. And then it moves to making an amends for all of that, you know, and apologizing to those you need to and to yourself and finding forgiveness for yourself. You know, my biggest therapeutic thing is I love smoking marijuana in the morning getting stoned and just letting my hand do the walking on a piece of paper. Mm. And I'll write out two or three pages, and then later on that night, I'll look at it and then write what I'm thinking at that point. You know, I think for me, the the, the writing yeah. has always helped me with the marijuana, especially like from, like last night I got home from the comedy store, 1130, you're wired up. You just did two motherfucking shows. You're yeah. yelling and screaming. You're jacked. Talking about Jesse Smollett and shit. <laughs> fucking it up. Yeah, motherfuckers. Fuck it up. Holy you know, fuck. Talk about that. Let's yet. talk about fucking it. it up. Oh, but man. you know what, man? Listen, I had a Santa Rhea godmother, and I went to see her in 1995 before I left New York. And she read my cards, and on the way out, she goes, do me a favor. Don't ever do business with three people. In 1985, the last thing she said to me is, don't, and you, it says right here, don't do business with three people. In 1987, what did I do? I set up a kidnapping with another guy and that. I, I remember when I turned myself in, I kept seeing images of my godmother wow. saying, don't do business with three people. That's what Jesse Smith That's did. all she said? He did business with three people. That's it. And two could always turn on you. And that's exactly what happened. And only one can keep a secret is two of them are dead. That's it. Only dead men tell you know? tales. So it's uh, it's really weird that you saw what went down. You can't believe it. But I don't blame it on Jesse Smollett. I blame it on the pressure that Hollywood puts on these kids, whether it's Hollywood makes us do some fucking dumb shit. If you fall you into think, that motherfucking listen, hole. No, okay. You think just for, like, attention? I don't or know. Just it's just to, crazy. You know what? The thing is, um, we want these people to love us. We want these people to give us jobs and we want to live our life happily ever after and be the head, sometimes be the head nigga on the team. I'm going to be the baddest nigga on the team. I'm the richest, the baddest, whatever it may be. You know what I mean? And then we forget um, we forget who we really are. You know, we get lost in this fucking cloud of success of what we believe is success, being different from what we were. You know, I've been to that stuff, just hating who I were. I don't want to be that person no more. That person, that, that person that, um, helped me become who, I'm, who I want to be. Mm. Why don't I want to be involved with that person no more in my life? I used to always be that way. I used to always want to close the door on my path, forget I was a thief. You know, my, my parents and they were street workers and all that stuff. So all that stuff would make people, you know, want to throw their old life away. But, you know, you always have to um, believe who you are and have to accept who you are. You know what I mean? And be conscious. You know, I always say, people tell people my conscience supersedes my color. You know, because I know what time it is out here. You know, I, mean, I know people from my experience in life and meeting cuss. You know?